So let's let's get back to our seats. We have just a heads up. We have this week and next week are our last two weeks of David, and then we'll be going into the book of Jude. So if you want to read ahead, that's where we're going. So this is David Part 10, and the title I had for this is two parts. It's You Are the Man and Joy of Salvation. And the You Are the Man is not like the positive one, like you're the man. It's the it's a negative one, like you're the you're the guy that you're thinking. So this is kind of a little bit of a downer. Um and I, I've actually felt like this one's not mysterious. There you read this story straight up and you understand everything I think that's in it and the severity of it. But it's a downer because I mean we've followed the story of David on lots of highs and lows, but this is probably the lowest of the lows in one sense. And so I want to do something different. I need two volunteers that are good at reading out loud. Two volunteers. Because it's two chapters. Second Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. And what I want you to do, the two volunteers that are going to come up here right now to help me. And yes. All right. So I'm going to have you read chapter 11 up here. And then you read chapter 12. Sound good? So just read to the, to the line there. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. When David sent messengers to get her, she came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, Haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and his lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drink. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. Then the men of the city came out and fought against Joab. Some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, When you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerubbasheth? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone? on him from the wall, so that he died in Tebez? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, Moreover, your servant, Uriah the Hittite, is dead. The messenger set out, and he arrived to tell David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, The men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall. 
and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, Say to Joab, Don't let this upset you. The sword devours, the sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord said, Nathan, to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then David said to Nathan, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah, and if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword from the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get up from the ground, but he refused. He would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, he put, lotion, put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food, and he ate. His attendants asked him, Why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan, the prophet, to name him Jedediah. Amen. Thank you for reading, guys. 
So I know there was a lot to read, but let me pray really briefly before we discuss this. So, Father, that's your word that we've just declared in this place. And I pray that you would bless our discussion of it and let it do to us what you would have it do in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a story that God has included in, in the Bible about David's life. And I wanted us to look at it as a whole so that we could see the kind of whole story arc, if you will. And I made a slide for this because we're going to talk through each one of these little these points very briefly because it's pretty apparent. I mean, I think we all understand everything that we just read. But you might see a pattern of this that you can relate to in your own life. The first thing is that David sins. He does something that's wrong. The second thing is David tries to hide it, and that makes things a lot worse. The third thing is he's caught or called out by God through the prophet. And then the fourth thing is he repents, and God, God does forgive. But the fifth thing, there's still a cost to the sin. And then the sixth thing is that God does ultimately redeem uh, the situation. So let's just look through it really briefly, and let's let the feelings of it really hit us as, as necessary. So, point one, David sins. And I, I, so, the situation, I've heard this taught a lot of times, and I, I don't have a dog in this fight per se, but as I was reading, I've heard a lot of people say that David should have been with his army while they were fighting. And then as I was reading this week, some of the commentators are like, well, actually, that's not technically true. They're like, if your army is well-maintained and you have capable leaders, you don't have to be with them physically, like physically present with the army while they're fighting. But the point being, mentally and focus, he should have been focused on where the, like, like when Uriah talks about the ark of God's presence, we talk about God's presence. God's presence was with the army, you know. And even if it's okay from like a king's job perspective to be back in the palace during this time frame, his mind and his focus and everything should have been on where his job, like his responsibilities were, which was this battle that they were engaged in with the Ammonites. And instead of that, he finds himself relaxing without his mind focused on what it needs to be focused on. And so his mind wanders, or his eyes wander in this case. And it leads directly to a couple things that, uh, that God specifically had already written about. Like, see, remember we talked about this whole thing when we got into David and Saul, that God didn't even want Israel to have a king. He made it very clear. He's like, I'm the king. You don't need a king. And they're like, but we want a, like a person king like everybody else. And he's like, yeah, but they're, it's not going to go well. And they're like, yeah, but we insist. He's like, yeah, but it's not going to go well. And they're like, but we really want it. And he's like, okay, I guess, you know. And, and we'll talk more about how God, again, the, thing, the, point, the main point of this whole thing is how God can redeem even the worst things we do. But look at this in Deuteronomy 17 when God was giving them laws and things to live by. He knew they were going to do this. God's not, like, surprised by our, like, things that surprise us don't surprise God. He's different than, that, than us. So even though God knew he didn't want them to have a king, he was going to be the king. I want to be, the, I'm go, I am the king, I'm God, and I'm, I'm like a special relationship with you guys. You don't need a human king the way you think you do. But I know you're going to want one, and so here's some, uh, here's some pointers for when you have one. Read this in Deuteronomy 17. This is just, he's listing off some different things about king, what the king should be like. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself. Or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them, for the Lord has told you you're not to go back that way again. See, this was as they were coming out of Egypt, way before David, okay? Just making sure we're all on the same page. He must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law. Taken from that of the Levitical priests, it is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that may, so that he may return, or sorry, he may learn to, re- this is why I didn't read earlier, <laughs> days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God, and follow carefully all the words of this law, and these decrees, and not consider himself to be better than his fellow Israelites, and turn from the law to the right or to the left, then he, then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel." And I think that it's pretty obvious that David was not li- abiding by this. And this is David, the guy that's like, he has a heart after God and all this kind of stuff. Even somebody like that can be distracted by circumstances of his life. And we find David in that kind of place where he's got a bunch of wives and he's got a bunch of stuff. And he's got, you know, maybe he's comfortable. Maybe he's not even, you know, his army is so well 
ran by other people. He doesn't even have to like worry about it. Like they'll take care of things, you know. And his mind is not focused on what it needs to be. And then you see that it, it moves into the second part. Or well, so th- so David sees something else he wants. And we don't need to get into too many details here because it's pretty obvious. But I, I, I do like to use this description that's in First John two fifteen through seventeen. Um, because it describes pretty well the kinds of things that start to distract all of us. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, and this is the description here, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So that basically encapsulates kind of everything that David stumbles in here. But then the other thing is it causes him to, when he sees Bathsheba, and he's like, man, uh, yes, please. There are two different ten, ten Commandments, which is like the, 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 the top list of you know, law things that God's like, this is what I want you to live by. Here's ten. Two, he breaks. Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery, which he does. And then, but before that, uh, Exodus 20, 17, another one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant. And, you know, and so he breaks one and then breaks the other. And they make a very clear point that she becomes pregnant by him. That's why they're talking about that cleansing ritual thing. And, uh, again, we don't need to get too detailed. But this is her kid, or this is his kid that happens. And so this moves us into the second point, that David tries to hide what he did wrong. So David did something bad. He sees something he wants, and he takes it. And then there's a... There's a result. He thinks he gets away with it, I guess. And then she's like, hey, guess what? I'm pregnant. And he's like, oh, no, I didn't get away with it. So he thinks, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I will get the other guy back, her actual husband, and then she'll, they'll be together, and then they'll think it's his kid, and then I'll be good. And then, But Uriah is not, he's focused, unlike David is. He's like, you know, I, the art, so when he brings him in, he's like, hey, man, hang out for a while. Now go see your wife. And then he does it, and he goes and sleeps on the floor, and he's like, I'm going to be, I'm in war mode, like, and he's not saying necessarily like you should be, but I kind of think you hear that. And there's like the ark of God's presence and God's like, they're, these people are dedicated to what God has for them to do. I can't get out of that mode and go into like relaxed mode. I need to be focused. So I'm going to live like they're living, even though you've called me here. So then David's like, okay, I know what I'll do. I'll get him drunk and then he'll forget all of that. So he tries and it still doesn't work. So David goes to the other plan, which is like, I guess I need to kill him which is in, super intense. So he tells Joab, he's like, hey, do this thing to get him killed. Like, get everybody to go forward and then have everybody but him pull back and then he'll get killed. And what happens is Joab, the reason there's this whole thing with Joab is Joab's like, okay, if I do that, everybody's going to know. <laughs> like, it's kind of obvious what just happened there, you know. And so he comes up with another plan that he's like, okay, I'm going to do it this way where we're just going to do something that I know militarily is not a good idea and he's going to die, but it might affect other people. And it does. So now David's plan to kill one guy, which is bad, ends up killing several people, you know. And so he's, the, Joab sends back a message to tell David. He's like, hey, it worked, but, you know, there's other people, you know. But David, hearing the good news in his mind, he's like, okay, whew, I'm, I'm saying, like, it worked. And he's like, don't worry, people die by the sword. It's not your fault, you know, wink. Let's, let's go ahead and, you know. So he thinks he gets away with it, you know. And this is the point I think a lot of us live in. Because we're not kings of Israel, and we're not uh, killing people, but we just do all sorts of things all the time that we don't want anybody to know about, and we think when we delete it, it's gone. You know, newsflash is Google may still know all kinds of things. You know, just FYI. But you know, everybody looks good till the FBI shows up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> is that too soon? I'm just kidding. I don't have an opinion on that. I was just making a joke. But the. Uh, but, yeah, I think we all kind of uh, try to hide all these things because we think that nobody will know. And the reason you need to hear this story is because it's an extreme reminder that, yeah, you might fool me. You know what I mean? I don't know what you're doing. Your friends sitting beside you may not know what you're doing. Your husband or wife may not know what you're doing. But that's when the chapter 12 starts because it says that this thing that he had done displeased God. And you're like, well, which thing that he had done? It was like the whole mess. Not only what he had done was wrong, but he'd also got the guy killed. This is when this is the thing to take. 
David is called out. This is the third point. And you see this, this is not a, an, an uncommon biblical theme. It's all over the place. The scripture that came to mind when Jesus is commissioning his disciples and he's talking about, you know, kind of, you're going to go out as ambassadors to the kingdom. You're going to do this and do this. And he's like, and it's going to be like this and not like that. And don't worry, like things are different in my kingdom. You know, I mean, it's like things are different in the kingdom of God, which we're all a part of as followers of Jesus. We're in the kingdom of God. But when he's laying that out, he's like, he's like all these things and the bad things people try to do, like he, he says it like this. So don't be afraid of them, the bad things, the bad people. He's like, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. So when you are hiding these kind of things, you're just hiding them from yourself or from the people around you. Nothing is hidden from God. You have to remember this. That's one, re- one of the biggest reasons this story is in the book. Because God's like, you think you're hiding this from me? And I think it goes in uh, the two main things about that. We use that type of hiding to justify things to ourselves. But deep down we know, and it's shown when Nathan comes, the prophet comes and has the parable of the guy who has everything, and he takes from a guy who has only one thing, the one thing he has, and kills it. And David is like, that's horrible. That's terribly wrong. And he says his whole verdict. And then he's like, "You're you're the man. You're the man in this story. And David, see, the, the, the truth is, even when we're hiding things, even when we're doing the wrong things and trying to get away with it, we know the truth when we're presented to it. Now, if he'd come straight in and said, hey, you did this thing with this guy's wife, I don't know if he would have been like, well, I mean, not exactly, and I'm the king. And, you know, he might have tried to wiggle his way out of it still, the way we do, you know. But when he's like, hey, guess what, this story, and he's like, what do you think about that? He's like, that's evil. That's the truth. And you know that the whole time. You just kind of find ways to, you know, say things just sort of ways. So it's like, it's cool, you know. But you have to be reminded that God sees and then we get away with nothing. And this is where you do see that God, David does have a heart after God where he does moves on to the fourth thing where David does repent. He says his immediate thing is, I've sinned. He doesn't sort of justify anything. He's like, I have sinned. And, um, and God does forgive him. He says that. And again, we'll go back to the New Testament again, the first John 1, 1 8, and 8 through 10, which is, you know, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So this applies to every single one of us here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? All. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I wonder if you need to hear both sides of this. Forgiving us of the bad things we've done. The unrighteousness that and then also purifying us from bad things done to us by other people. Both of those things are included. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. That's if you're denying it. Like, Dave, you know, David doesn't deny it. He, he admits it immediately. And God does forgive him. He says, and then Nathan the prophet says, you're not going to die. But, and this is the thing that you have to remember, even forgiven, because we've all done things. Some of us have done some, some pretty rotten things. And as you stand before God and as you confess to other people and like, God will forgive you, but there's a cost to it. It doesn't just make it all go away in the sense of your Uriah is still dead. It's not like God goes, okay, and he's back. Everything's good. And you never did this thing that you did. Now, as far as you stand before God, as far as all this kind of salvation and stuff, which we can talk at the end about that. Sure, but in this world that we're living in, God doesn't just say, therefore, nothing about it matters anymore. None of those bad things you said to those people, they don't matter at all. You know, all those horrible things you did, no, none of that matters. You know, there's still a cost to it. So all Dave, David, he, he steals a guy's wife. He has that guy and a couple other people killed in the, in the midst of this whole thing. He repents. God forgives him. But God says, hey, because you did this thing as a gross offense 
to what to me. <laughs> There's going to be calamity on your house, and we'll talk about that in our last message next week about kind of what happens. Like, this wasn't necessarily how it was going to go, but there's some bad things that come down in the, in the next couple chapters that weren't part of the plan. You follow what I mean? And, and the innocent child dies from this whole situation. And David is grieved by this, so he's like, well, I'm going to try to at least pray that maybe God would stop the child dying part and he asks for mercy and it doesn't come you know and this should wake you up a lot about the severity you know we we talk about i mean we were just singing about great is his faithfulness to us and how much he forgives us and everything and it is it's it's this amazing thing but if you only ever focus on how sin affects just you you start to lose the severity of it and you even, I would say, decrease the importance and the effectiveness of what Jesus did on the cross. Remember, there's, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, this whole thing. Because our sin has a cost to others. He, and then, but David does everything he can to make it right. He really, he's like, God, please. But he doesn't get it. So that's a pretty dark story. Except for at the end, there's this little glimmer of hope where this is the last point that God ultimately redeems it. So, Kayla, I want you to come on up here. Because, they, like a couple of weeks ago, remember we talked about them bringing the ark in and that Saul's daughter, who is David's wife, Michal, looks out on David and sees him dancing and she, like, criticizes him. And... The, the word says she's barren from that day on. And I don't think that we need to hear that in a principalized sort of way, not just she's not having children. But the idea that when you criticize the worship of other people, the life that comes from you is shriveled up. You see what I'm saying? So that's what happens with one of David's wives where God's like, you know, that's an intense kind of verdict right there. And then now you have this story where David literally steals um, a wife from another person, God could have gone, you know, because of this whole thing you did, that whole marriage is a mess. Like, I'm going to, you know, we're not going to go with that. But they have another kid together. And it's Solomon, who we do know eventually comes and becomes king, and he's wise, and he builds the temple of God. And, and it says this, she gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. The Lord didn't hate him. The Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he went, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. And like I said, Solomon goes on to build the temple of God. Which is, a, which you need to take that home and ponder it. That David did have a bunch of wives, even though it says in Deuteronomy he probably shouldn't have. And he had different kids with these different wives, and you'll see some of the calamity that comes out of that. But God could have had any one of them be the king next, and he chose Solomon. And so one of the things that I think that we need to hold on to is the fact that God can redeem anything. The cross of Jesus Christ is the worst thing that human beings have ever done. We have God who comes to us to heal all creation, reconnect us with God announce his kingdom and the new heaven and new earth, the whole thing, free us from sin, all the, the death, the cost of sin, everything. He's doing so many things to this. He's God in human form, walking among us, Emmanuel, the whole thing. Yet, our response as humanity was to kill him. And the reason we have a cross hanging up here isn't because it's pretty or whatever. This was a torture device where they would hang people up because it took them a long time to die and they would suffer a lot. And that's the way they killed Jesus. And God goes through all of that because it's necessary as he sheds his blood as the forgiveness for all of these bad things that we've done, just like David. And you can kind of church it up or something where you're like, yeah, I've heard all of that, to where you start to, I mean, everything, like all the bad things. I mean, think about the worst things in the world that you've experienced or that you've even ever heard of. And that probably doesn't even start to... 
I mean all of the bad things. All the bad things that have been done by all humans. And it's like how many seven or eight billion of us right now? On every day, I mean, how many bad things do you think we can do? Hebrews 9, 14 and 15 says this. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that can lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal, promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So what do we do? We repent and we confess James 5.16 says this, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The blood of Jesus has been shed for us. We take on when we have communion together like we did the last two weeks. That blood is a representation of God cleans, giving us his life into our, our into ours and cleansing us of all the wrong things, everything we've done, and all the wrong things that have been done to us by other people, that cost that we talked about. I want you to stand because like we read earlier that anyone who says they're without sin is deceiving, is, is you know, making God out to be a liar and that's not something you want to do. And if you claim to be without sin, you deceive yourselves. This is something we all need to do. Some of us have more to do. Like David God can forgive you in an instant. And that even happens in this story. He says, I have sinned. And he's like, God has forgiven you. But there's some things that are going to happen. And there's things you're going to have to do. Part of when you, when you are forgiven, you take responsibility for these things. And you make things right. Because sometimes it takes a while. Even with the situation with David where he didn't even get what he wanted. And he didn't deserve to get what he wanted. But he still fasted and prayed for days. Seeking God and all of that sort of thing. So there's this... You have something maybe, or you may, I mean, as I'm speaking, if something's coming to mind, you need to deal with that. And I mean, what I mean by that is you need to deal with it between God, with some other people. If you need to talk to a pastor, come to me, come to Pastor Kevin. There's other people that will pray with you. But also, there's going to be things you have to probably deal with in the real world. It's not just this imaginary friend that makes all of your bad feelings go away. There's people that you need to apologize to. There's things you need to make right. If you've done something illegal, there may be legal consequences to it. And that's, that's actually totally in alignment with the scripture and the story we just read. But David wrote this psalm in this time frame. If you look this up in your Bible, it probably actually has a little heading that says, David wrote this after sinning with Bathsheba. And as we read through this, you're going to go, wow. I've seen so many of little chunks of this on like happy sunset pictures, you know, on the internet or on posters and stuff. And you're like, is that where that came from? Yes, that's where that came from. Because the truth is this. That's why I picked the title of this. You are the man. When he says this to him, he's saying, you've done all of these things. You've done all of these things. And it's a pretty dark story. But the truth is, because of what God has done, <laughs> we can receive forgiveness for that. And understand the joy of our salvation, which is the freedom that comes from all those things. And when we deserve death, we don't get it. But only when you're honest and you understand that you are the man. Pray this with me. Let's read this together. Psalm 57, put this up. This is a prayer that David wrote to God that we're going to say together as a church. And then Kayla's going to lead us in a closing song. And if after we sing this, you want to come forward to spend some time with God at the altar, feel free to do so. And then I'll come and bless the food. So pray this with me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Hey, wait, we need to read this well, guys. So read this out loud. All right, ready? Is it different? All right, I'll read that one. All right, ready? <laughs> Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your rings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sins from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness.
This isn't the right scripture. All right, take that down. That wasn't, I was like, well, that translation, first off, I thought it was the exact same one I had up here, which I think it should have been. I don't know what that was. I'm going to read this then. That's what it said, but this is, here, let me just read this to you, all right? Do I have, maybe I have the wrong number. 51 is the one I'm looking for. Put 51 up. Sorry. Technicalities. They, but they start the same way. Yeah, we need mercy, technological mercy. I still love technology. Here, I'll just read it. Let's leave it black, all right? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure or clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach trans your pressures your ways so that sinners will turn back to you deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed O god you who are god, my savior and my tongue will sing of your righteousness open my lips O lord and my mouth will declare your praise you do not delight in sacrifice or i would bring it you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings my sacrifice O god is a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion and to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So, Father, I pray that you would move in our hearts and in areas where we try to hide. Father, remind us that all things are going to be brought forth. Father, I pray that you would let us to be a people who repent to you and turn back to you and to your ways and to, your, to the ways of your kingdom. Jesus, you are king of this place. We ask that you would move Holy Spirit in this time. In Jesus' name, amen.